I would like now to announce uh, for a last, uh, uh, for a last uh, presentation uh, of the afternoon, uh, Clelia Tsivkovki, uh, Tsi sorry about this, it's so complicated, Tsivkovki uh, to be the other uh, guest uh, of the social design uh, uh, department. You are also graduate uh, from uh, the social design uh, course and I think you come from Skopje, from Macedonia uh, and will present another uh, approach. I have the title here, Small Victories. Uh, I hope you will stay here afterwards. There will be uh, uh, another break uh, and at six we'll have our final panel. But now please give um, uh, Clelia the chance uh, to present uh, her activity. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you very much for having me. It's, uh, it's not on? OK, there we go. Okay. Good afternoon, and thanks, uh, thank you so much for the invitation. It's really, uh, I'm really happy to be uh, presenting alongside such impressive uh, panelists. And uh, thank you, Udus, for helping me with my presentation. Uh, my name is Lilia and I come from Skopje and I'm here to tell you a little bit about um, my project, uh, my master thesis project, but first a little bit of a background story. Uh, so in 2009, uh, the life in Skopje took a turn that none of us actually could have ever predicted. Um, a video called something along the lines of a vision for Skopje in 2014 um, dawned on us one day and the video showcased a digital mock-up of what the central uh, city area should look like in the next years until the year 2014. Uh, this is what the main square used to look like. And this is next slide, please. Pull this. Next slide. <laughs> and this is what the digital mock-up of the uh, what it was supposed to look like, of what they wanted to look like. Um, so the video represented a vision of the government at the time, or the same government that the people in Macedonia are not now trying to change of what the Macedonian national identity is. And uh, it was a vision that was denouncing uh, most of the uh, country's recent history and replacing it with objects, facades, and monuments um, that supposedly represented the authentic Macedonian history, uh, one about antique Macedonians, uh, descendants of Alexander the Great, and similar nationalistic propaganda. Uh, and in the process of all of this, uh, actively replacing the um, <laughs> Yeah, actively replacing the memories that we actually have of the city. So this is what the city looks like now. Uh, the, uh, it's um, horrible, honestly. <laughs> so this was the beginning, 2009 was the beginning of um, what came to be a great divide among the people who live in Macedonia. On one side were the supporters of the project Skopje 2014 and end of the nationalistic agenda or as they like to call themselves patriots or uh, antique Macedonians or um, her inheritance of Alexander the Great. And on the other side were, you know, um, us, <laughs> the other people, <laughs> uh, or we were labeled as traitors or um, supporter supporters of a foreign agenda that was supposedly aimed at destabilizing the Macedonian society. Crazy. Um, while it was the inception of a very fruitful period of uh, mocking the government and mocking this project and coming up with uh, different ways to ridicule that everything that was happening, uh, it was also really heartbreaking and really painful to see the city and our home and the city that we know disappear right before our eyes and apparently no amount of protest could have ever stopped it or could have ever even slowed this process down because now we are here. <laughs> Um, I hope it is not um, disrespectful of me to use this word, but for me this felt as, uh, and it still feels like some sort of exile. And um, it is in a multicultural society like Macedonia, where a lot of ethnicities live, and a lot of different cultures ex have existed for a very long time, and not just in the recent history, this project was and still is a very violent decision to decide which culture will be the dominant culture. And it is not a decision that was made based on facts, but rather based on a very nationalistic agenda. So long story short, we fast forward to this present, uh, where buildings like this one, 
This is an old brutalist building. Uh, next slide, please. Are being remodeled into Baroque or whatever the style is in this ridiculous way, where literally their facades are just being replaced. Uh, and it, it looks like this. So this is <laughs> this is basically what's happening. Welcome to Macedonia. <laughs> Um, when I had to decide what my master project would be, even though I was living in Vienna, Skopje was still my home and it was still in my heart and it, um, it, it was somehow natural for me that I, my master thesis would be about Skopje. But still I was, um, even though I was here, even though I felt empowered from the perspective that I gained from studying at the University of Applied Arts, I was still paralyzed by helplessness and this sort of inherent inability to recognize what me as an aspiring researcher or dare I say, dare I say an artist could even do in such a poor polarized society. So in this uh, state of unknowing, I turned to the people who have already worked as artists in such a uh, situation, the people that I know from Macedonia, who are uh, artists I respect a lot, and I started talking to them and asking them to answer a few questions in order for me to gain some sort of understanding of how they shaped their own respective practices in this society. So in this process, my main question was what they thought the role of contemporary art was in advancing social change in such a polarized situation. After having um, several conversations like this, with, uh, mainly with artists, but also with different kinds of practitioners of the arts and humanities, um, uh, and combining it with my own observations of the city and overlapping a few key words such as narratives, authenticity, archiving, memories, belonging in the sense of uh, ownership, in the sense of belonging, etc. It was only a natural progression for me that um, I would do a project that documented the city that was somehow disappearing before our eyes, but we all felt was still there underneath the plaster, because apparently it still is there underneath the plaster, we just cannot really remove it. Um, and it was my idea to kind of document uh, the, what I came to call the our time in Skopje, and by our time I don't mean the time of my generation, I'm just using it as a parallel to the, uh, to the contemporary history of Macedonia because I come from the generation that was born literally at the start of Macedonia's independence from Yugoslavia, so it kind of to me had a poetic. Um, so with my mindset on the idea of collecting and archiving, I created the concept of an archive called Small Victories, or the archive that insists. Um, since this idea is not just to pile together and collect and categorize stories, but to rather treat them as a living matter that kind of changes and evolves and we can somehow interact with and represent in different ways rather than just archive it and uh, replicate the standardized museum and archive model. So, sorry. Uh, small victories are small and precise situations or places that are documented um, and archived using storytelling methods, but particularly focusing on artistic methods and on uh, places and uh, situations and actions in the city which, which don't have a consumerist character. To illustrate the point, please next slide. Uh, this is the screenshot of a blog that I made which I will talk about uh, next. Um, I uh, did an interview with um, a book sales, old book sales vendor from Macedonia. Um, uh, this is just one of the projects because I will not uh, talk about the projects that, I sell, uh, that are published on the website, but rather more about the context in which this project was created. But just to illustrate the point, um, two of the projects that are shown on the website are created out of an interview I did with this woman who sells old books in the main square amidst all the dramatic change of the public space. And she has been there for almost 26 years, which is as old as I am, literally. And um, she's almost been there in the very same spot and her stand is very noticeable because she has this wall of books and every time we pass she's there and it looks very firm and very kind of poignant. And she's always there reading books and just chatting with almost everybody that walks by and stops by to say a few words. Uh, and the first thing that I did was uh, write a text based on the interviews where I kind of intertwined the quotations to turn them into, um, 
uh, text rather than a normal question and answer interview or reproduction of an interview. And I made an audio piece which was aired on a radio with which I have a collaboration and that's going to be the, uh, one of the next points. So the reason why I chose her is because uh, her presence to me amidst all these new facades and new monuments that are supposed to tell our history is her and her presence to me is a monument to at least to my history because as long as I can remember I've been buying books from her, talking to her, I've, um, uh, she also comes from a family of artists and writers and directors and people who are also kind of uh, active in the um, surviving independent culture of Macedonia. And uh, she to me is a representative of the uh, city history that still belongs to us. The aim of the archive is to both ask and uh, at least offer possible answers to the questions such as, but not limited to, what gives a place its value? How are memories and personal stories materialized in public spaces? What does belonging mean in a changing and living urban environment? Or how is it possible to preserve authenticity in such a setting? So uh, I set out to research these questions through collecting said stories and working with them in a way in which it was enabled to discover the unique knowledge contained in personal experiences. <laughs> Although oral history is the main historical document in Macedonia, we learned most of our historical facts from oral histories that, was, that were kind of retold. These types of stories are still treated as of a lesser value, if any value is even added to them. So this project made sense in that, in that direction too. So the first thing I did was establish this blog where, uh, I, uh, published the, um, where I published the projects that are collected, the documented, documentation of, of them, and also where I publish information about uh, possible events that may happen, like uh, radio shows or meetings or some um, small uh, interventions that happen around the city and also uh, ways in which people can contribute and information about the project. The second dimension that I added to this uh, is the radio show, uh, which um, is uh, uh, aired, uh, sadly it only aired once, but it, we're preparing the second show. Um, it's, a, it's a radio that exists in the national building, uh, the, net, the, the building of the national television, and it's illegally there, so it's not, it's not a legal radio, it's a clandestine frequency, and it has also existed since Macedonia's, uh, a bit later than Macedonia's independence, so since, not since 91, but since 96, and uh, it's basically possibly the only physically physical space in a public institution which is actually free, especially in a media context right now. Um, the third dimension of, is that, please the next slide, yeah. The third dimension is uh, what I came to call the small victory square. This is a light sign that I made which says small victory square. And I put this sign um, in this kind of very narrow passage between some old buildings that were built before this government came to rule and new buildings which were built recently in, in the time of this project while it was developing. Um, the reason why I did this it is to kind of connect my project to the actual physical space in Skopje and also to add this dimension of appropriation of a space and assigning the idea of small victories of this really precise but very meaningful actions to an actual physical space. I also really like the idea of creating artifacts from this project and adding a tactile dimension, not just a digital or an audio dimension. So um, I created this object which exists and I want to use it in further actions as well. And I also made postcards um, that I had addressed to me here in Vienna and stamped in advance. And I gave them to a select group of writers and asked them to write to me about the small victories of the city. And sadly, I only received four because, as many things in Macedonia, the Macedonian post office is not very reliable. <laughs> but um, I am going to continue doing this and I want to collect all the postcards and sort of keep them as an in, um, in, an, in some sort of a book that can be viewed um, and also uh, put in different places around the city, such as the old bookshop. And this is the building where the radio is, by the way. This is the national television building. 
and this is the only building in Skopje where you can actually go inside at in four in the morning and just say, I'm just going to the radio and they're going to be like, oh yeah, okay, go there. It's crazy. <laughs> um, so, um, next slide please. And yeah, this is the question that everybody asks me and I ask myself, so now what? I graduated and the project seemingly did its purpose in the beginning, that was its purpose in the beginning, which was to make me a master of art. <laughs> And now, um, now I really want to uh, kind of orientate it more towards um, not only collecting and archiving the memories that we have of the city and sort of establishing these experiences and raising them to the level of institutionalized knowledge such as oral history, but also to ask and provide maybe answers to questions such as how can we create space to understand how societies can benefit from art in transitioning cultures and authoritative regimes. Uh, how can we as artists, researchers, practitioners hold the fort for art in this dialogue? Uh, so these are not easy questions to answer and I am sure that the answers of them can vary extremely. But I do believe that these are the ones that are not asked enough, at least not in our city. And in spite of the continuous effort of those who even started to ask them long before I even knew these problems existed. Therefore, I would like to use everything I've learned and I continue to learn um, and combine it with my own love and knowledge for this city to give at least one possible answer and uh, work towards uh, creating this space that I feel we need to create. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Clelia, for your, um, for your presentation. Always when I see these uh, images uh, of the uh, baroquization of uh, Skopje, uh, I feel reminded of concepts that took place uh, in Austria 100 years ago with Hugo von Hofmannsthal and others uh, who tried around the Salzburg Festival uh, establish uh, the Baroque, the Neo-Baroque as the main cultural policy dimension full of representativity and totality uh, and that's what I get here and I think your project is also to be understood to counter-attack, to question, to irritate this kind of representativity and uh, uh, totality uh, and very fine that you gave us at least some glimpses of uh, that. Uh, are there any questions? Um, please. Thank you. Um, thank you for your presentation. I have one comment and one question. The comment concerns the bridge that you showed, this first slide. Reminds me very much of an equally ugly, uh, pretentious bridge in Moscow. You know, in Moscow they reconstructed a huge chap um, a chapel. I don't know whether it was huge. It is huge now because it was reconstructed with the help of Gazprom and uh, you know, players like that. And it, it's a, a, a bridge that crosses the river to that uh, gigantic cathedral, not a chapel, it's a cathedral. And it's also like fake, neo, I don't know, neo something. Uh, my question is, you spoke of a clandestine radio in the middle of the national uh, television radio building. How clandestine is it, if, if everybody knows it's there? Yeah, this is the, this is the wonderful ambivalence of um, nobody thinking with their own brains in this authoritative regime that, uh, uh, so basically this radio was established in the early inception of the Macedonian tele radio and television um, uh, uh, agency. Okay. <laughs> um, and it was established as an experimental program that was about uh, just test testing the frequency and seeing whether this transmitter actually works. works. Mm -hmm. And it was given in the beginning to uh, young, young adolescents who loved music and who owned vinyl records to kind of just play music on this frequency uh, just to see how it works and these were kids that were related to the people who worked in the television but it was a different time and it was a time when people were still not so power hungry at least in my opinion so um, at some point when this uh, changed and when they said okay you cannot work on this frequency anymore. The people, the, the kids re actually refused to stop. So they kind of started continuing to, uh, they continued to work and they were assigned an editor who actually worked 
in the television that really protected the radio and made sure that they are not kept quiet because mm. they were voicing, you know, opinions that were even then, uh, especially then, that were, you know, not so, um, people did, just didn't want to hear them. So, at some point it was closed due to political pressure, but then it was opened again a few years later. I, I cannot remember exactly how, but um, I mean, I personally know the people, I mean, personally know, and we all know each other in Skopje, it's a very, very small city, but like, uh, but it's still, um, it's still the only place that I can personally responsibly say that is really unrelated to both political agenda. I, everybody wonders how this still exists because if people wanted to shut it down, they very easily could. And only recently, actually, policemen started to invade the radio, which never happened before. So in the middle of a show, they would go in and ask the uh, people to show their IDs, etc. So this only recently started happening before okay. it was different. Okay, but just it's not really clandestine. I mean, people know it's not like hidden offshore. It's in the no, no, no. it's in plain view, everybody right? Knows it's there. Yeah. The people who work in the yeah. television, everybody knows. And I just want to add that the bridge that you meant, uh, commented on actually also leads to a chapel of sorts, which is the one of the financial police in Macedonia. So. Thank you. Other comments, advices for the next? No, I just maybe I, I didn't pay enough attention. But what was written on the box, on the light box, which we saw on the on the on, on the image here? Yeah, it says a square, small victory. It's like ah. square, like plus. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. One day you're gonna kill me about the question, but I just had to ask because of recent events. And because I'm also attached to the city as much as you are, uh, you talked about small w victories that uh, different artists kind of created for themselves and for certain parts of the city. But actually, I don't know how many of you have read about it. Like in the last uh, few days, uh, masses of people walked around Skopje and actually threw colors and drew graffiti on all those hideous objects and statues that we have. So. I was wondering, would you put it like as part of all those small victories, or do you think that it kind of reaches a whole new level, like coloring all those um, objects, etc., around the city? Well, I'm not gonna kill you. It's okay, we're safe. <laughs> it's, um, uh, it's actually a good question because I was thinking about it as well because I also really wanted to sort of have a documentation of this. Uh, it's called uh, in the you know the circles of the people who protest. It's called the colorful revolution. I really would love to actually include something from it, but I want to still keep it in the spirit of the project because the whole idea of this project was not to report on events, but to record personal experiences. So I would either ask somebody who I here had a personal experience that I would like to preserve, to document it or to you know uh, reproduce it in a way which I can uh, publish. Or um, I would just share the project and tell people if you have something to, to, you know, that you want me to show, please send it to me. But it's definitely a good point and I already thought about it. <laughs> Thanks for the question. So thank you very much again, uh, Clelia, uh, for the presentation. Uh, a short half an hour break uh, and then uh, the final discussion. Thank you for your patience.